<laughs> yes. I'd like to um, have you address what is a perception of a much more basic nature and that deals with the economic, uh, political, and moral aspects of basic science. If you take a thousand scientists, randomly selected, some are young, struggling to make a name for themselves, having difficulty finding a job, others in the middle age that are pretty well established, and you have a few Nobel laureates at the top. The majority of the funding for scientific research either comes from the government, NIH, DOD, or in the case of Cal, British Petroleum. That is a money train that is going down the road. And you as a scientist who allegedly, not you personally, but a scientist who is allegedly uncorrupted and is looking for pure scientific data that they either establish and interpret or don't, either has a choice to make, get on the train or get off. If the government discovers, if a politician like Al Gore creates, discovers a problem, global warming, which of course he only has the solution to, and the government buys into that, the money to fund the research to solve the problem comes from the government. And as a scientist who's hard pressed to keep a job, is looking for income for the University Research Center, no. better go along with that train or they're going to be out of a job. So they have to corrupt their thought process in order to maintain their position. I think you expressed it very well. Uh, I can uh, amplify this a little bit from my own experience. I was fortunate enough to get what is called tenure immediately. Um, when I entered the university uh, academic life, that uh, was because I had worked in astrophysics, space physics. I had no concern about anything that had any policy significance. I mean, no one cares about the origin of the moon, really. Congress is not going to pass any laws that relate to it. No regulations have been issued on the subject and so on. However, a young man, a woman, entering academic life today, uh, in order to advance, in order to uh, achieve the goal, which is to become a tenured professor, um, which is still the goal for many people, has to publish. Publish or perish is, is the way it is expressed. And if, they ha if, the, income, if the person has an insufficient number of good publications, he probably will not get promotion in tenure. How do you get publications? Well, you have to do research. How do you do research? Well, you have to have resources, you have money. How do you get money? You have to write a proposal to the government. So now, guess what? If your proposal says, I'm going to show that global warming doesn't exist, or I'm going to show that it's not due to human causes, you're not very likely to get money from the present government, or the former government, for that matter. I'm not partisan of this issue. Uh, I don't think that the Bush administration in this respect was any, any worse than the present one. They're about the same, so same people are running this show. Yes. These people who are running the show are policymakers. Do do you do you think they believe this research? That's a good question. Do the people actually believe not only in global warming, human being human caused, but that it is catastrophic, that it will in fact uh, cause great economic damage, or worse, be the end of humanity on this planet? Uh, wipe out all, uh, all life, animals, and so on. You know, if you've read these stories. Do they believe this? I think it varies from, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are some who actually believe it, but I don't, th I don't think the, the, the majority actually believes this. They believe that it could be warming, 
and now they've established that two degrees warming is crucial. If it is more than two degrees, if it is less than two degrees, it's okay. That's two degrees centigrade, two degrees Celsius. If it's more than two degrees, then suddenly all hell breaks loose. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't make, doesn't make any, any sense. The current focus has been on global warming. It appears that the discussion is moving from global warming to climate change to climate disruption. Uh, have you had any thoughts on climate disruption and now it's really variability that the look, we're looking at in terms of the model of predicting variability or is this? I'm relying on David to compress the question into several He's words. asking if the, if the debate has moved from global warming to climate, to climate disruption. Yes. They've changed the terminology <coughs> twice now. Uh, from global warming, it, it went to climate change. And more recently, I noticed in the last couple of years, it changed to climate disruption. So that's the, that's the buzzword now. As if any change in climate, and of course the climate has been changing in the past, is necessarily a disruption. It is not. So where the variability will be going up with a one degree temperature change? Have you seen any model predictions that would show? No, the models cannot predict any abrupt changes. The models predict only a smooth general warming, which is going along with a smooth general increase in greenhouse gases. Either two, last year, and I think it was last year or the year before, there were claims that I've only seen in the press that it was the hottest year ever. And so where did that come from? Um, do you have any idea? There's an interesting situation here. Uh, it's worth discussing in, in some detail. I think the effort is to confuse the public by confusing two concepts that are really different. One is the level of temperature, the level of warming, and the other is a trend. Uh, the first is measured in degrees Celsius, the level of temperature. And there's no question that the present decade is the warmest in the last 150 years or since the Little Ice Age stopped mm -hmm. because there has been a general increase in temperature. Actually, temperature increase in steps. However, during the same decade, the trend measured in degrees per decade, which is different than temperature level, the trend has been downward. And this disagrees with the predictions of climate models because they predict an upward trend in consonance with the upward trend in carbon dioxide. So uh, unfortunately, public is confused about this and they're being told that this is the warmest decade. They think this proves that it must be human caused. Mm -hmm. That's not at all. Uh, the change in reflectivity, or albedo, uh, on the planet um, has been demonstrated not only from Martian Spensmark's work, but also from Big Bear here in California, uh, measuring it, and there's almost 11 times more energy came into the atmosphere that it changed from 1984 to 1998, and the decline since then, than you can get from greenhouse gases. Uh, on top of that, we've also had a solar increase, uh, which is we double the increase in energy that you can get from the energy that the global warming community said came from the sun. When you put those two together, you can predict the last hundred years of the, the change in temperatures uh, on the globe uh, because of just, just solar changes and the effects on clouds. Can you comment on some of that information that's recently come out, including the recent uh, the research that showed that um, in uh, Denmark, the uh, high energy particles could cause changes in clouds themselves. What's the question? That's, the question is <clears throat> the uh, data for solar variability well, and also the other effect? The albedo. The albedo. <coughs> and this relates to Fritz's in Denmark's research, right? 
I personally believe that the evidence favors external forcing <coughs> and that is, must be from the sun. Um, many of my colleagues believe internal forcing, internal oscillations, and they may also be correct. Um, they they uh, use evidence to, to suggest that. Models, by the way, don't predict anything of that sort. Models cannot show the effects of internal oscillations, and models do not show the effects of solar changes. They just ignore them. So models are not helpful here. However, having said all of this, I always confess to you that I do not make predictions about the future because I don't understand what the sun is going to do. I don't know enough about the sun, I don't think anyone does, to know what the sun is going to be doing next year, five years from now, 10 years from now, or 100 years from now. The sun may do some surprising things. It all has to do with internal operation of the sun, which no one has really thoroughly investigated. So instead of making predictions, my general purpose has been to try to understand the past, to understand the reason for past climate change. If I can do that, I'll be satisfied. But you agree with him about the pattern of solar variability in the, his, in the history? The pattern of solar variability matches very well the pattern of, of climate change. And how about the albedo change itself, too, that's related to that? The albedo, the albedo change. change. Well, El Nino and all that. I'm reluctant to get into details here. Uh, but uh, yes, that uh, would be part of it. Uh, getting down to practical matters for us poor Californians, uh, we have a lot of policies that are based on this incorrect science, uh, namely the lovely Global Warming Solutions Act brought in by our past governor, Schwarzenegger, uh, AB 32, and uh, which is going to effectively put a cap and trade on the whole of the state. Um, there are other ones that have followed on from that, including the uh, clean energy that's uh, trying to be instituted in a lot of the counties. This is based on cutting greenhouse gases and reducing global warming. Um, so how do, how do we counteract all this false uh, basis for all these policies that are going to affect our lives, bump up electricity to huge levels, and drive businesses out of the state. Okay, I'll tell you how to do that. Change the legislature. <laughs> We're trying. You're blessed in California with a fractious legislature in Sacramento, and you're also blessed with CARB. CARB it has a pernicious influence on the economy of the state of California. And until you get rid of CARB, and specifically of Mary Nichols, you're not going to get anywhere. CARB is an anacronym. CARB, California Air yeah, Resources Board. Board. Right. The other one is BCDC, which is uh, putting in great uh, rules and regs because they think the uh, sea level rise is about to jump up and 20 feet. <coughs> They're not finished yet with you yet. And it's going to get worse. It's on, uh, on buildings. Well, there are in also a sense, it's wonderful that Jerry Brown is in charge because he now has to deal with real problems. And we'll see how well he does. It seems to me that, that the global warming scientific debate is unusually uncooperative in that the skeptics have a difficult time getting data from the proponents. Is that true? Is this, is the, is this yes. debate more acrimonious, and why is that? It's worse than that. Uh, we not only have difficulty getting data, some data, particularly uh, surface data, we have difficulty publishing our work because the societies, the professional societies, which depend very much on money from the government now, have become beholden to the government and have all become politically correct. We're speaking about the American Meteorological Society and the American Geophysical Union. Even my professional American Physical Society, we're having problems with them. 
I don't know what we can do about this. We're fighting this as best we can. They also control many of the journals, or most of the journals. Science Magazine, which is a premier journal in the United States, has the largest circulation, very prestigious, has been for many years run by a man called Don Kennedy, who used to be president of Stanford until he was kicked out for uh, a minor scandal. Nothing sexual, <laughs> just a minor scandal. Uh, he's now back as a professor. He was very bad for science. Before that, we had Dan Koshland as, as editor. He was quite good. He was a professor at Berkeley. And he's uh, passed away, unfortunately. Anyway, uh, from the Climate Gate emails that have been leaked, we've discovered that there are uh, conspiracies among groups of scientists, or a uh, one group of scientists, who control or try to control the refereeing process, the peer review process. And they actually say, we're going to make sure that this paper never gets published. And they exert pressure on editors. Sometimes the editors are more than willing to be pressured. Sometimes they're not. One editor was fired on their request because he was trying to be independent. So, yes, we are having great difficulties. Is the internet helping uh, expose people to the truth? Because you don't have to wait for a journal. You just get a blog or you have a website. Sorry, what was that? She's asking you if the internet is helping since yes. you don't have to wait for the journal. The internet certainly helps. And we have, uh, internet is more or less controlled by skeptics. Um, because it's completely free. Mm -hmm. However, it doesn't carry the prestige of the journals because it has, quote, no peer review. But peer review is nonsense. If the peer review process is perverted, as we've established from these emails. In other words, if a group gets together, let me say, for example, I'm fighting one of their, uh, my adversary, who happens to be in California, when he publishes, he, he has about 20 co-authors. 20. Why? I don't know. It's his paper. He puts them on, and then they can no longer act as independent referees. That's right. They are bound to uh, advise against publishing any paper that goes contrary to their own publication. So it's bribery. <laughs> Basically. Mm -hmm. I've had that experience. You said that uh, uh, both natural <coughs> and man-made causes uh, were operative and that uh, natural causes were more important. Uh, and going back to the, uh, the man-made portion, I'm wondering uh, when do you think that man-made effects began to be reflected in the temperature record and also how would you know? He's asking <laughs> about how would you be able to determine if the temperature change is man-made or not, or natural, in the, in the data? Well, this is, of course, uh, you put your finger on the most important question. How to tell whether the temperature change is man-made or natural, is that? Yes, essentially. That's right, right, Carl? How much? Um, How, much? Has to compare. How much? Where's the tipping point? How much can you tell where the, break, the break, breakdown is? That's difficult. Um, you know, whether it's 1% or 5% or, or even 10%, all we can say is we don't see in, we don't see in, the, in the published record, in the observations, we don't see any evidence for man-made global warming. We don't see it. However, it must be there. It, must, it cannot be zero. It must be greater than zero. But greater than zero can be 1%. In other words, it is insignificant. And this means that it is insignificant also in the future. This means that there's not any policy reason to be concerned about human influence on climate. Can you, can you, can you narrow it down to you have greenhouse gases, and there are different greenhouse gases that make up part of the atmosphere, right? And CO2 is what percentage of that? 
Uh, CO2 is the most important of the man-made greenhouse gases, yes. But how much of the atmosphere is CO2? Uh, at the moment, around 400 parts per million. Okay, but what percent, say? 400 parts per million. Okay, Four, about 0.4%. Percent. Um, that's... 4%. Um, uh, no, it's less than 4. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, 0.04%. Okay, so of that, what percent of CO2 is man-made? Oh, that we can tell. Approximately 30%. Okay, so 30% of... The other the, number. Uh, existing CO2 is certainly of human origin. Okay, so if the, the most uh, common uh, greenhouse gas is water vapor, correct? Yes. Okay. So the most important greenhouse. It, but uh, that is considered natural. Yeah. And the IPCC does not consider that. Well, it's not in the models, is that correct? No, it's not in the models. Okay. probably a good point to uh, uh, bring forth in discussion, the beneficial aspects of CO2. These have been demonstrated again and again in countless experiments by agriculturalists. In fact, a greenhouse, commercial greenhouse operators will enhance the CO2 content of the greenhouse atmosphere to make plants grow faster and produce better plants, more fruit, and so on. Also, another advantage is that if there's a higher greenhouse content, higher CO2 content, excuse me, in the atmosphere, not only do plants grow faster and better, but they require less water. This requires a little explanation. Uh, plants grow by using CO2 and water. So if they grow faster, how come they require less water? And the answer is, they close their stomata in the leaves and use less water by transpiration. And that is important. That is an important water loss. So in other words, plants can survive droughts much better if there's more CO2 in the atmosphere. They also can survive uh, various kinds of pollution. They can survive pests, insects, and other things. But not humans. You know, we still eat them. Yeah. If climate change and everything is so hugely costly, then why is the government bought into it head over heels? Well, if, if climate change is so costly, why is the government bought into it head over heels? Because there's money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are now important constituencies, well, the government, of course, one cannot speak of the government. Uh, there are important constituencies now that benefit financially from government programs, obviously from subsidies, tax breaks, and everything else. Uh, I won't list them all. There are too many. There are too many. Uh, and uh, they are important. They influence legislation. They influence Congress and to influence the executive branch of government at the expense of uh, taxpayers and the general public. <coughs> somebody, has, somebody pays for all this. Okay, go ahead. The question is, why is it, why is it that global warming has become uh, the hook that is being used as opposed to some other 
issue. And it's sort of a lead in, I think, to the limits to growth point. I mean, why, I mean, global warming it seems to have come out of nowhere in the last 20 years. Why was it effective? And it, um, in other words, the money started going to global warming and that's and that snowballed. But why was it able to, to get traction? You know, right here in Oakland, California, you had uh, a, a great man who was unfortunately passed away, uh, Professor Aaron Wildowski, of uh, the University of California, Berkeley. He lived in Oakland. He was our, one of our founding advisors. In fact, that's how we met. That's right. Uh, uh, who said or wrote that global warming is the mother of all environmental scares. Why? Because it touches on industrial development. Uh, energy creation, energy production, is the lifeblood of our civilization and of our prosperity. And without energy, we would fail. We would live as people, as the aborigines do in Australia, or the natives in some parts of Africa. So the Luddites who hate economic development, hate progress, hate civilization, hate mankind, have fixed on global warming as their method of attack. Because it, it is a method of doing away with energy. Uh, it's interesting. They oppose any kind of energy that works and will promote any kind of energy generation that doesn't work. Nowadays, they're against nuclear energy, which we know works and doesn't create any carbon dioxide. So in that sense, it's clean. I hate that word, <laughs> clean. And against that. So any, any energy that works. Now they're trying to stop natural gas because it works. It has become cheap. It's inexpensive, that's right. Last question right here. The gentleman, Bob. Two, did, you get, did you hear that? I'm relying on the chairman to okay. compress all of these questions okay. so the, the, into five words. The first point is there's assumption that the current climate or something in the, a certain level of CO2 is optimal. Okay, That's, that's the first a, it, part, right? The yeah. second part is that the, is, it, is it not really the story of interest groups, sort of the north-south the north, so, north south dispute, so-called, okay, between development and non-development, right, in different, among different countries that want to redistribute wealth and so on and so forth. Isn't that really the, a lot of the engine of the whole so thing? So there are two separate issues. Right. I like the first one particularly. You all heard of Dr. Pangloss? Who says this is the best of all possible worlds? Well, this is the best of all possible climates. Why? How do we know that? Well, we know that a colder climate is bad for us. We know that. Because crops will fail, people will starve, food will become expensive, and all kinds of reasons. And we're being told that a warmer climate is bad. Well, that means this present climate must be the best of all possible climates. Logic, isn't it? So when you think about this, you have to ask, why should that be? Why should the present climate be the best of all possible climates? Why not the climate 10 years ago or 20 years ago? Was that bad? And the second issue, which was... Uh, the north-south dispute of oh redistributing yeah, wealth. And there's so no north-south dispute. Uh, the question has, is, is quite old, and I've lived with it now for some decades. The question is a redistribution of the world income. Uh, the developing countries, the poor countries, see this as a means of getting money from the developed countries. And they've used various uh, methods to do that. Global warming is the latest. They say we're going to suffer because of global warming, which is not true, and therefore we require large subsidies. When you really analyze it, and again I quote Aaron Waldowski, this transfer of income is from the poor in the rich countries to the rich in the poor countries. 
It's a cynical way of looking at it, but it's true, largely true. Thank you, Fred. If you join me in a round of applause. <laughs> Fred, Fred is viewed as the dean of the climate realists and has inspired many scholars around the world, many scientists, including a lot of younger scientists. And uh, this, the impact that he and, and his, his brothers and sisters have, have had has been quite astounding. Um, for those of you who haven't gotten a copy of Hot Talk Cold Science, um, I hope you get a chance. Fred will be delighted to autograph copies. I also want to mention this is also another uh, report that we did that Fred is, was one of the co-authors of, uh, which um, discusses the hockey stick more specifically. And um, uh, I want to thank everyone for coming and making this so successful. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much.